Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 9th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, Many talk a good game about building the Alaska economy, but then they turn around and use the revenue tool that has the largest adverse impact on it. Second, why it's time to start thinking seriously about restructuring the permanent fund board. And third, it's not just Democrats that want to spend more state money without considering who pays. This week's ADN has an op-ed by a Republican elected official proposing the same thing. And now, let's join Michael. Today, we're going to talk about um, the uh, a bunch of stuff, but the first one is the economics of the PFD um, and how, uh, anyway, I just give me, give me the rundown here, what you're talking about. Uh, with your <laughs> thoughts on I can't even, I can't even form a cohesive sentence at this point. So let's go. Well, there have been, there have been several editorials, op-eds, including one by me, um, uh, reactions to that, articles, uh, uh, reporting pieces uh, this past couple of weeks on the PFD. And there's one consistent theme, I would hope not including mine, but there's one consistent theme that I sort of see through all of these. There's two issues that the PFD raised to me. One is the fairness issue. Are we treating middle and lower income Alaska families fairly? The second is the economics issue, the economic impact issue. And that's the issue that's captured by ICER's 2016 analysis that's still valid today that says cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy. The theme running, the, 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 constant, the constancy between the various articles, some of the op-eds and, uh, and other things uh, that we've seen and heard over the past week is people focusing on the fairness issue. And they want to say, and, and the fairness issue sort of devolves into, yes, we know we're treating middle and lower income Alaska families uh, unfairly uh, by using PFD cuts to fund government, but give us that money and we'll treat them fairly by directing government programs that, that respond, respond to their needs. Typically, in that in that conversation, they focus on lower income families, and and leave out middle income families. But but nonetheless, they try to deal with the fairness issue by saying, we've got a response to the fairness issue. The thing that's the thing that's increasingly troubling me is is very few to none of these discussions focus on the economic issue. It's like it's like if you ignore it it'll go away. The economic issue is cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy uh, for two reasons. One is its regressivity. It takes more money out of the people who would spend the money, out of the hands of the people who would spend the money, middle and lower income Alaska families. But the second, the second, the second economic issue is the fact that it focuses all of the burden on Alaska families, unlike in 49 other states. Uh, they, we don't spread the burden to include non-residents. And non-residents would contribute, according to the ICER 2016 study, 
I've updated it to look at uh, at more recent analyses of of uh, of people coming into this or or non non residents working in the state would 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 reduce the burden on Alaska families between ten and fifteen percent. That is that that instead of a hundred million dollars that Alaskans would have to contribute to to fund government, Alaskans would only have to contribute. 85 to 90 million dollars, the other 15 to 10 million dollars would come out of, out of every hundred million dollars would come from uh, would come from non-residents, reducing the burden on Alaskans uh, and reducing the burden on the Alaska economy, making the Alaska economy stronger by reducing that burden. Virtually none of the comments, um, articles, analyses, politic, politicians, statements, op-eds by the ADA and editorial board, op-eds in the Juno Empire, virtually none of those confront the economics issue. Sometimes people will say, oh, well, that's based on a 2016 study that, that identified, that was focused on the short-term economic impacts on Alaska of PFD cuts. But here's the deal. The factors that influence the outcome of that short-term, of those short-term uh, impacts are long-term, they're persistent. Two things, one, the regressivity that takes more, that takes most of the money out of the hands of people who would spend it, middle and lower income Alaska families. That's persistent, it, the regressivity doesn't get, doesn't get any less over time. And the second is, the, is focusing all of the burden on Alaska families uh, by using PFD cuts as opposed to a broader base tax that would, that would include non-residents. That doesn't change over time, PFD cuts, continue to take money out of the hands of, of Alaska families do not have non-residents contributing. So when people say, oh, that's just the, the ICER analysis was just focused on short-term impacts. Well, that piece of the ICER analysis has is, is persistent, is a, is a long-term impact because the factors that affect it are long-term uh, are long-term factors. So people just, I'm, I'm, it, it's, 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 disconcerting to see people say, oh, we've got to focus on the Alaska economy. We need to, you know, provide jobs to Alaskans. We need to provide income to Alaskans. We need to provide uh, uh, economic, uh, uh, we need to improve the economics of, uh, of the Alaska situation. So a lot of times people say by spending more here or spending more on con construction budget or spending to support childcare or spending to, to, uh, uh, to support K through 12, but here is an example of, of a very real, real policy that we know has adverse economic impacts on, on the overall Alaska economy using PFD cuts as opposed to, as opposed to other forms of revenue. That's, that's a situation that we know has an adverse impact on the Alaska economy. And people just skip over that. They say, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't want to, you know, you know we don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about all these other economic factors like that we that we think we can cure by spending money, spending government money uh, to cure them. We don't want to talk about an economic factor that we can control by how we by how we collect the money. So I, it's it's it is disingenuous uh, to me uh, when we see all of these PFD articles and we see you know things like uh, an op-ed that says the PFD is primarily a political problem. Uh, Becky Bohr wrote an, an, uh, for the Associated Press an article that's titled Alaskans got a $1,312 $1, dividend check this year. The political cost of the benefits high. Uh, 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 a KT uh, uh, UU article that says state lawmakers weigh changes to permanent fund dividend formula ahead of legislative session. And they're talking about, you know, the 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 fact that that we need to that we can cut the PFD and we can address the issues of lower income Alaska families by by government spending. It is it's disconcerting not to see any of those, not to see the ADN op ed page, not to see uh, articles from the Associated Press or the Alaska Beacon or others, not to see articles in the KT in, in the on television, the television uh, commentary not to see any of those focused on the on the economic impact. And that's, I mean, as I say, there's two issues coming from the PFD. One is the one is the fairness issue. And evidently we can talk about that, you know, until we're all blue in the face. But there's the second issue of the economic impact, and we just don't see anybody talking about that. 
investment. The other the other piece of the economic impact is what Rob Myers talks about. What are we doing? What are we doing long term? What are we doing by by continually funding more and more government spending by taking money out of the private sector and creating a dependence on government? That's also an economic issue, and nobody's talking about that. So it's 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 it, as I say, it's disconcerting, it's disingenuous to see people, you know talk a lot about PFD and talk a lot about the need for PFD reform without addressing the impact of what we're currently doing on the economy uh, through PFD cuts. I thought it was interesting that uh, one uh, article that you talked about from the AP, because I saw the AP article uh, outside of our discussions um, for one of the morning, from one of the morning news roundups. And I was like, that uh, it just, you know, the, the political cost for the benefit is high. I mean, what are we talking about here? These people love taking that money. Everybody's on board. The, there's a few that are crying about, uh, uh, you know, them not following the law, et cetera, et cetera. What real political cost? They're getting everything that they want. I mean, they are getting access to the main piggy bank there and able to spend it on whatever pet project they want. I didn't see a high political cost there. I mean, this last year, there was not a contentious debate over the PFD. Right. I mean, the year before. Yeah. I mean, there was some there was some infighting. But uh, th this last year, no, it was pretty much I mean, they knew they didn't have the upper hand. There was no discussion really on the classic formula. The fight was kind of over the 50 50, but really that wasn't even really much of a fight by the time it was all said and done. Yeah, it's a there was a fight in the House on the floor in the House. The Senate sort of forced it through, but there was a fight on the floor uh, in the House. And that's where. Uh, uh, the representative from Juneau made uh, made the, uh, the 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 now infamous statement: "Free rides die hard." Right? A right. Democrat legislator, Democrat legislator, complaining about uh, uh, you know people trying to defend the PFD, which has the largest, which has which has a positive impact on the on the constituents that she claims to represent. Um, it, so there was a fight. There, there was a fight about it in the House, but even there, even there, there wasn't a fight about the economic impact. I mean, Republicans who who say, you know, the economy is the most important thing that if you if you get the economy right, the rest of the, the rest of government, the rest of the society will fall in place. Uh, uh, fine. We don't need to worry about much else. If we can just have jobs, and we can just have, you know, positive economic economic impact. If we can have income, even Republicans who you know prioritize that and say that's the that's the that's the touchstone that they're that they're driving toward. They don't talk much. I mean, Rob's sort of the exception to that. Ben sometimes is the exception to that. But they don't talk much about, about the economic impact. They don't talk about the economic impact, the adverse economic impact of using PFD cuts. They don't talk about the fact that using PFD cuts concentrates the burden of government, the cost of government on only Alaskans without getting a contribution from non-residents like happens in the other 49 states. They, they don't, they don't talk about that even. So it's, it's, it's disappointing to see that absence of, you know, in, in a state and, 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 and in, with a group that that claims economics are everything economic, you know, the, the jobs and, and, and income are everything not to have that discussion around, uh, around the PFD couple comments here one that i saw from uh uh brian uh he was talking when you were talking about non-residents he said but on the other hand the non-residents don't consume much of the way of state services do they question mark uh what's your well, yeah go ahead well some of the non-residents i mean we've talked about this on the show before some of the non-residents are military uh who go to our schools who use our roads who uh uh, who uh, use uh, uh, support services in in some cases? So so that segment uh, certainly does. But but it's non residents may use less. They use the roads. They use the airports. They use they use state funded services that way. But look at what look at what Alaska is giving up compared to the other forty nine states. They wouldn't non residents don't use state services any more or any less. Uh, than uh, than in other states, but other states view them and view their income uh, or their their purchases in terms of sales taxes view them as an opportunity to reduce the burden uh, on their in-state residents. And 49 other states, in varying ways, some ways through sales taxes, sometimes through 
uh, income taxes, sometimes through uh, New Hampshire's uh, uh, investment tax. Um, but in varying ways, every other state takes advantage of that non of that non resident income source as a way of reducing the, the burden on Alaska on, on residents. Alaska doesn't. Uh, and as a result, compared to the other 49 states, our residents are burdened much more heavily uh, than uh, than the residents of other states. So I, we can we can debate about how much services they use. We can debate about, uh, you know, whether they're just fly in, fly out or whether like the military, they're 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 permanently here using the schools and other pieces. Uh, but but the fact is, we're giving up a revenue source. Uh, that other states use uh, and would could be used to reduce the burden on Alaska families. Uh, Anthony says, talking about political costs, you know, he's like, dude, like 12% of the population voted. That means there was only a 12% margin of cost politically. It's true. I mean, really, I mean, who's, is anybody, is this thing on? Anybody really paying attention? I mean, that's, that's, we just saw this election come out here. Um, you know, for the local municipalities and, and for the, for the boroughs and stuff. And yeah, I mean, 18%, uh, you know, uh, uh, 18% turnout, I think was the highest, uh, some of the bar, some of the districts were down as low as 6%. I mean, people are just, I don't know if they're throwing their hands up in the air or what. Yeah. Well, they may be throwing their hands up in the air, but the, but the representatives that we elect how, what, by whatever, whatever means or whatever population elects them, they're supposed to be looking out for the economy. I mean, that's that's why we elect them. They're supposed to be maximizing the Alaska economy. They're supposed to be looking out for, for Alaska citizens and reducing the burden, reducing the burden of, of government costs on Alaska citizens. And and this group that we've elected by, you know, by 12% or 18% or 2% or or whatever, whatever we've elected them, they're not. They're 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 looking out they're looking out for a segment of the Alaska economy those that currently don't have any revenue burden on them uh, they're looking out for that small segment but 80 percent of Alaska families and the overall Alaska economy they're not looking out for uh, uh, for those people so yeah we 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 elect them with a with a small with small number participating but they're supposed to have the broader view. We're back uh, talking to uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. The weekly top three, we're on a number two, which is a discussion about the Permanent Fund Corporation Board. Uh, politicized? Question mark? Yes, more, no. Uh, what do we need to do, Brad? What's, the, what's your thoughts here? I've become increasingly concerned with the direction the Permanent Fund Board uh, is taking they uh, the the thought the the thought a few months ago of of setting aside a portion of the fund to focus on Alaska investments without regard to the returns uh, that they might generate without without using the money to seek the best overall return wherever it is in the world uh, to take a portion of the money and set it aside and focus on Alaska specifically um, uh, I was concerned about that because the permanent fund boards. Permanent fund's role is to maximize earnings, right? It's not to it's not to try to be a, a second uh, uh, ADA and uh, prop up uh, industries uh, inside the state or prop up industries anyplace. It's to get get the return, generate earnings. That's its entire entire focus. And the fact that they took a portion of the money and set it aside for in-state projects, sort of duplicating what ADA does, uh, that bothered me. The whole discussion about setting up an Anchorage office. Um, and as sort of a as sort of a first step of slowly moving the permanent fund board, or maybe quickly once they get at it, uh, the permanent fund corporation to uh, to Anchorage, uh, that bothered me. Uh, and now this past week, uh, at the last board meeting, they had a uh, they had a discussion about uh, proposing legis- Some of them had a discussion about proposing legislation to exempt the permanent fund board from the open, open meeting act uh, open meetings act uh, and uh, and allow them to go into executive sessions sort of on a whim whenever they want to uh, to discuss whatever they want to including uh, including investments and and investment uh, policy uh, which would make you know returning to the let's set aside a portion to you know to benefit our friends and friends and neighbors uh, 
uh, by investing on, in in-state projects would make that a whole lot easier and a whole lot less transparent to the rest of Alaskans. I think I think the permanent fund board uh, may be sort of spinning off in a direction that is that is problematic. It is a political board. Uh, it's in, 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 in appointed uh, by gov- by the governors. Uh, doesn't even have legislative confirmation. Two of the members, two of the six members, are uh, members of uh, of the administration itself. Are have to be commissioners. Uh, the other four are appointed by the governor, and and now, given the turnover that's occurred since uh, since uh, uh, Dunleavy took office, now all of the uh, appointees are are uh, Dunleavy appointees again without legislative confirmation, without legislative vetting. Um, and I and I and I think we're seeing a direction. We we see the potential, and I, in fact, think I'm seeing the the like the the the, the actuality of the permanent fund board being used to for political purposes to pursue political agendas um, uh, in priority to uh, its primary purpose of generating generating returns. Larry Smith from Homer, uh, who was the uh, compiler, the editor of of uh, uh, Governor Hammond's Diapering the Devil, uh, that book was published posthumously. Uh, Hammond had uh, completed most of it. A lot of it came from his prior books, but he he supplemented it with additional material. Uh, great book uh, that talks about Alaska fiscal policy still has relevance today. Uh, when Hammond died, uh, the, the 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 manuscript went to Larry Smith, and Larry Smith edited the completion of it. Larry Smith had a uh, has a has a letter in the ADN a week ago uh, that talks about permanent fund trustee selection and talks about it being that we need to professionalize it. We need to need to make it uh, at least subject to legislative confirmation, if not setting up a board uh, that that nominates in the, in the same way, maybe a preferable way, but in the same way as the judicial board uh, nominates uh, judges, uh, nominates uh, professionals uh, for the the permanent fund board and 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 depoliticize it. Uh, the permanent fund board was set up at a time when Larry makes the point, and others have made the point. The permanent fund board was set up at, at a time when the state was really just investing in bonds and just riskless, low risk uh, 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 investments, and really was was just sort of running it like a like a widow's trust, if you will, uh, something that's just you know the the primary objective is to avoid risk. Permanent fund has changed a lot. Uh, since those days, well, and it was also in the beginning, it was also dealing with fairly low, low amounts of uh, of investment uh, capital. Uh, permanent funds changed a lot uh, in those days. It is now investing all over the place in uh, in a small share still in bonds, but a lot of it in stocks, and even more of it in alternative equity investments, private fund where they're co-funding with uh, or co-participating. Uh, with uh, uh, hedge funds and uh, and investment bankers and uh, in various projects in in ways that aren't always obvious, uh, produce returns but aren't always obvious. Um, in the permanent in the in the permanent fund operation, the permanent fund investments, uh, the size of the permanent fund has changed significantly since uh, since its formation. So Larry makes the point it's it that it's time to reassess how we appoint these permanent fund uh, board uh, uh, trustees and and how we, you know, the professionalism that we try to bring to the permanent fund board as opposed to the politicization uh, that's been brought to the permanent fund board uh, over the past uh, over the past few years and and concerns about what that politicization is doing to uh, to investments. I think that's I think it's a great letter. I think it's actually it's it's very timely to consider this back in the late 1990s. One of the state's regulatory agencies, the Alaska Public Utilities Commission, sort of spun off and did bizarre things. It sort of got into itself and really wasn't wasn't reflecting the policy I think that Alaska uh, needed at the time. And what the legislature did was step in, let the APUC set, sunset, and then set up the Regulatory Commission of Alaska as a successor that uh, that much more reflected the rules that and and the approach that I think. Uh, Alaska needed for the modern age. It's it it may be time to do the same thing with the permanent fund board. It may be time to let the existing permanent fund board set, sunset, 
and then uh, replace it with a uh, with a board that's much more professional and much more focused on in the on the mission, which is generating returns as opposed to all of these side projects that uh, that right. the current current permanent fund board seems right. to be getting into. I think Larry's Larry's uh, uh, letter is nice. It's short, concise. It gives us a great overview. But I really loved Paul Jenkins' letter because maybe it just maybe his style is more my style. But the headline just caught my attention. It said the permanent fund trustees make enough dumb decisions in plain view. Imagine if they could shut out the public entirely. And he's, of course, talking specifically about trying to exempt themselves from the Open Meetings Act. And that goes into some of the details of uh, of what you're talking about there. And then, of course, of, you know, all these things that could be done behind closed doors. And we don't need more. We need more transparency, not less transparency. And it's really uh, it's really shocking to see that this is the move and the direction that they're trying to take in this day and age when people are trying to shine more and more light on government and try and see to, you know, to uh, to unfog the fog of war, so to speak. And that's the direction they're going. Part of the problem, part of the problem, Michael, too, is I've heard I've heard a lot of people discuss recently that the that the objective of the permanent fund board ought to be to get it to one hundred billion dollars, um, and then it can generate enough earnings to to sustain state spending. That's not true, given given where oil uh, revenues are going. But but that that's that's the objective of it, and I think that's leading the permanent fund board potentially into risky investments in this stretch drive to get to $100 billion. Up to this point, it's been, let's make solid investments, let's generate solid returns, let's let's choose among the various options out there in the world to, to continue to grow the permanent fund. Try, now setting an artificial target and trying to stretch drive toward that will lead you to make more risky investments to try to achieve the higher returns you need uh, to get to the hundred million dollars, I don't think we need that objective. Uh, I think we just need to stay in the mode that we've been in, which is to find solid investments that produce solid returns, have solid uh, uh, financials around them, and keep going down down that road. So I just, I, I just, I, I'm increasingly uncomfortable with the direction that the permanent fund board is taking it. Not only the political stuff of investing in state, not only the uh, uh, the 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 discussion about, you know, let us do it in secret, but I'm just increasingly uncomfortable with sort of the, the fundamental drive of what the, of what the permanent fund board's trying to do. So I, I think it's time to evaluate uh, what we, what we've been doing, what the, what this board is doing and look at whether there's a better structure to try to achieve the objective that we set originally for it. And quickly, if you had your druthers, what would you say? Would you say board confirmation by the legislature? I mean, not that I necessarily am a huge fan of the legislature on top of it. And you already know that their goal is, again, the $100, million, $100 billion mark, but uh, for many of them anyway. Uh, so what would your what would your solution be? I think Larry, I think Larry's outline, Larry's letter outlines an approach that would set up sort of a, a nominating board that would focus on uh, professionalism, focus on uh, 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 status, uh, uh, professional status. We don't have any investment bankers, uh, as far as I know, on the board right now. Um, and we don't have anybody who talks the language. Well, Ellie Rubenstein might classify as one, but we don't have, <laughs> I'm sure I trust her, but we don't have, we don't have people who, who understand uh, sort of the dynamics of what goes on in the investment community. Or we have one, and she's sort of leading everybody else around by the nose. I think, I think, sort of re-looking at the criteria, and maybe having a pre-clearance and then legislative confirmation, uh, to some degree, as we do with judges, uh, is a uh, is an approach that uh, that has a lot of merit. Uh, Politidix said the PFD board needs to be voted on by the shareholders. We Alaskans. Uh, AK legislature governor needs to be completely removed from any choice on who's on it. Otherwise, people like Natasha use their influence to manipulate them to do what they want, not Alaskans. I mean, board of directors, shareholders. Uh, I mean, I <clears throat> would like to see somebody with a track record on there. Uh, that, to me, would be the important part. Do they have a track record of creating those kind of investments more than anything else? I don't want it to be a popularity contest necessarily. I'd like it to be some people with actually some experience. We got enough problems with elections uh, and with, with the lack of campaign of limits on campaign contributions. Can you imagine if, uh, if we have elections about who controls, you know, $70 billion worth 
uh, of investment, what that would look like and, and the, the amount of money that would flow in to uh, influence uh, that election. Uh, the oil companies want somebody to help invest in them. You know, somebody wants to help invest in them. Well, just go just go buy the permanent fund board through an election. I Yeah, I, I, I appreciate the the comment or the point about having it reflect the, the views of of individual Alaskans, but I'm not sure an election is the is the uh, is the right way to do that. Anthony has a great point. I think he kind of summates the whole <laughs> the whole PFD thing here. Uh, I mean, it's a it's a little pessimistic, but I I like it. He said the pre the PFD is pretty much a necessity for most lower middle class families. So naturally, it's a great weapon to use politically. Republicans want to make it bigger to help you out. Democrats want to make it smaller to build up services that help you out. Meanwhile, we do nothing to address the insane cost of living or government spending itself. It's all political theater, guys. And uh, while that is kind of a pessimistic comment, I don't know that he's far too gone on that. I think it's it's kind of that's the thing. It seems like uh, a little bit of kabuki theater going on in there. We do have those that are trying to fight uh, for the PFD, but they've been pretty much sidelined at this point. It's a, it's a tough situation. It, it, it is politicized. I mean, I'm, I guess the articles, I guess the articles I was talking about in the first segment that talk about the political aspects of it with rather than the economic as without even mentioning the economic aspects, I guess those reflect the reality of or the, the, the reality we're in. I guess those reflect that, that it is a, a highly politicized process. My point about that is it shouldn't be. It, it should. It should. We should focus on, on the economics. I mean, everybody talks a good game about strong economy, strong jobs, strong economic growth, strong income. Everybody talks a good game about that, uh, but nobody focus. Nobody's focusing on, on the economics of it, the economic impact of of using PFD cuts. So. I mean, Anthony's Anthony's comment seems to be right in terms of capturing what the reality is. But the reality, I guess my point is the reality is wrong. The reality is not reflecting the right the right issue that we ought to be focusing on, sure. which is what's in the best interest of the overall Alaska economy. Well, sure, we don't want to think or believe that it's theater, but at this point it is kind of theatric to see what's going on with this. The ultimate goal, as you said, is to push the permanent fund itself over a $100 billion so they can spin off and be completely disconnected from everything else. And that's, I mean, that's, again, everything that they're doing up until that point is kind of the theater of the moment of, uh, of you know, how do we how do we look good? How do we look like we're protecting you? How do we look like we are taking care of you? Um, as, uh, uh, you know, to help you out as, as Anthony's saying, um, and how do we look good doing it? That's so, I mean, it has been that, like you said, that political theater, uh, that we're dealing with on a daily basis. And that's what those articles, I think that goes right back to your point on number one. Yeah, it, 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 it it's, um, political theater and it's, um, uh, it's political theater. So here's my, here's, here's sort of the real crux of my problem with, with the, with the op-eds and the, and the articles not addressing the economic issue. They aren't educating Alaskans about what's really important uh, in, in, in the PFD battle. They aren't, they aren't helping Alaskans understand the adverse impact of using PFD cuts to fund government, the adverse impact of that on, on the economy relative to other alternatives. And so it's, it's sort of this vicious circle, right? I mean, it's the, 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 the people act that it's, people talk about it as a political issue and so politicians act on it as a political issue. And so the press talks about it more, even more as a political issue and the politicians act on it. Somebody, I, I tried with the op-ed, I'm not sure how much progress I made, but somebody has got to stand up and say, look, this is, it, let's talk about the fairness issue at some point, but this is an economics issue. This is an issue about what's in the best interest of the Alaska economy, jobs and income. And let's focus on that folks, because we say we do, Let's actually go through and do it, and let's focus on the PFD in that way. The weekly top three continues. We talked about the economics of the PFD versus the politics of it. We've talked about the permanent fund board, and now we're moving on to conservatives, quote unquote, who are spending all that they want to, or look at they're looking at all that spending. Brad, you were talking about a letter that Dan Sullivan wrote, 
and kind of a, 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 a indicator of things to come or things that have been happening or things that are going to continue to happen? What's your what's your take here? Things to come, Michael. This is this goes under the category of never let a crisis go to waste. Right. We've uh, we've got a gas. We've got a natural gas situation in South Central. Cook Inlet's in decline. It's been in decline for a long time, but now it's in decline to the point where where there may not be enough gas to supply all of the all of the demand that we've built up around it, uh, both home heating as well as uh, as well as electric generation, and so and so we're looking at options on how to deal with uh, uh, with natural gas in South Central. Never let a crisis go to waste. We, in a previous show, a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, we talked about some people coming out and saying, "Oh, we need to give more credits." Uh, uh, production credits to get Cook Inlet gas producers to encourage them, incentivize them to uh, to go produce additional gas. Or we need to. Uh, I think George Rauscher's proposal was just do away with royalty from uh, from the. We've already done away with tax, so just do away from royalty. Essentially, that would be let the producers keep all the revenues, not no revenue sharing with the state uh, from uh, from Cook Inlet production, and let that incentivize them. Uh, to uh, to go out and explore for and uh, and produce an additional gas without any demonstration, by the way, without any evidence that that giving them more money either in the form of credits or give or or or, or rebating the, the the royalty without any evidence that that would actually increase production. Um, uh, but but nevertheless, we've had politicians talk about that this week. Uh, this weekend in the ADN, we had an op-ed from Senator Dan Sullivan. Uh, the op-ed is entitled uh, "Stars Are Aligned to Make a Major Push for Alaska LNG." This is sort of the article. This is sort of the op-ed we get from somebody every you know few months, every three months or so. Somebody writes an op-ed about how LNG is just on the cusp. If we just hang on long enough, LNG is just on the cusp. This one from Dan Sullivan has buried down in the I don't know maybe the tenth paragraph, guessing. Uh, has, has this, like we have in the past, Alaska's elected officials need to work together to focus on the immediate challenge and the opportunities that this project presents. AGDC, the Alaska Gas Development Corporation, is working to secure $150 million for the next step in the project to finish the front end engineering and design. Having the state as a co-investor alongside the private sector in this phase would send a strong signal to investors and help Alaska LNG's chances of getting over the finish line. Well, guess what that is? That's a pitch. I mean, it doesn't say it in, in, in those words, but what it is is a pitch for the state legislature to step in and fund a significant share, if not all, of the $150 million for the next phase of right. studies that get us to the point where we may be <laughs> in the hunt uh, with other projects for LNG. Look, LNG would be a great thing. It would be a wonderful thing to, to have for the state. It would mean jobs. It would mean uh, gas supply to Fairbanks and to South Central uh, in a way that's not dependent on the Cook Inlet. Uh, it would mean exports. It would mean, uh, it would mean potentially mean, uh, depending upon what the value of, at the wellhead is, given the gas at the wellhead, it would potentially mean revenues uh, for the state, though that's not guaranteed. Um, look, it'd be, it'd, it'd mean great things, but you know, the Matsu rail extension at one point was supposed to mean great things. Look what the, look what the Matsu rail extension is going to do, uh, do for the state or look at what, you know, the, the grain silos and Valdez or the barley project up in the Delta, uh, is going to do in Alaska. We're great at coming up with ways with, with projects that will make the state great. All we have to do is spend money on them. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and look at the benefits. Well, you know, the benefits seldom show up. TAPS, which, which Sullivan interestingly enough cites in, uh, uh, in, the, in, in his uh, editorial, was built with all private money. These great things, these great things, if they're so great, if the economics of them are so great, then the private sector ought to be the, ought to be the one that uh, is chomping at the bit to go right. forward and, and do them. These pitches about just give us a little bit more state money and we'll be there, um, and uh, and we'll be right on the cusp of doing it. Those those are sounding increasingly hollow to me, especially when, uh, just like the Democrats, when they talk about 
just give us a little bit more K through 12 spending or just give us a little bit more university spending or just give us a little bit more child care uh, subsidies. And we'll be in and we'll be right on the cusp of making Alaska great again, especially when, you know, they have these columns about talking about the spending, but don't address who pays. Right. And guess guess who would end up paying for this hundred and fifty million dollars or guess who guess who would pay for the hundred and twenty five million dollars. Every or guess time- who's going to. Yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize. Every time I hear uh, about this argument, all I can think of is sitting in Jim Whitaker's office, who's the former mayor of the North Star Borough, and he was also on the Port Authority there, the Gas Line Port Authority and Fairbanks and everything. And he had this he had this thing framed behind his desk, and it said, "Gas in Alaska next year." And I'm like, "Okay, great." It was a Daily News article from 1957 or something. I mean, it was just like gas tomorrow gas how much have we poured into this already brad i mean since the palin start and and, in all this other kind of stuff how many million when walker was there how many millions of dollars have we done for front end work and FERC and all this other kind of stuff we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on this but all we need is another 150 million dollars more to take it over the finish line for a 45 billion dollar pipeline how much do we have to partner up to do i mean it's it's you know you, fool me once fool me 53 times is a whole <laughs> yeah that's and that's sort of what we're getting into michael i mean it's it's just give us 150 million dollars more and we'll be we'll be or george rouser just you know just just give up on on royalties from the cook inlet or you know give them credits other other re- legislators have proposed credits just give us give them a little bit more and and, and we'll be fine all sorts of great things will happen well we did that in the in the early 20 teens. We gave a lot of credits to, uh, to to Cook Inlet producers, and we got a little bit of gas for a little bit longer. But here we are in 2020, in the early 20 2020s, right back at it, right back in the same situation. The fact is, the incentives are not there for for producers to to develop uh, uh, the Cook Inlet, to to explore in the Cook Inlet, and for the state artificially to try to create that market. Uh, at expense to the state uh, is 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 one thing, and then when you look at who, who they want to pay for, what what I always get about what what always gets me about these is Dan Sullivan is is clearly in the top percent, top twenty percent, maybe in the top five percent. Hell, he may be in the, even in the top one percent, and 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 for him to say, yeah, let's just spend more money. Well, who's paying for it, Dan? It's not you. It's not your friends. It's not the. It wouldn't be the contractors who get the contracts to do the front end engineering. A lot of whom are out of state, by the way, and who don't don't contribute to Alaska's uh, uh, revenue base. It's not any of them. It would be middle and lower income Alaska families uh, that you're biting yet again for uh, for another you know shot at the shot at the prize. So it, it's it, it, for, for somebody who's been through this war. I don't know how many times somebody who's been through these cycles how many times it's just a little bit humorous to see another headline that says you know stars are aligned to make a major to make a major it doesn't even say stars are aligned for alaska lng it says stars are aligned to make a major push for alaska lng and then and then read down through i just anymore i just read for where the dollar sign is right <laughs> Don't even bother to read the words. Just look where the dollar sign is and then read the words around the dollar sign to read down through and it says, oh, AGDC is working to secure just another $150 more for the next step in the project to finish the front end engineering and design so that we can stay in so that we can stay in the game. It's um I yeah, at some time at, at some point I've just become very uh very uh, uh, cynical about uh, about this whole well, process. Well, it's understandable. None of this is going to work out until the economics of it work out. When the market demand is high enough, when things are going well, then they'll pull the gas. I would like to see it tomorrow too, but does it make sense for us to pour billions of dollars into it when there's not enough demand uh, and there's not enough interest and it doesn't economically pencil out at the end? I mean, great. Yeah. And and Dan, if it's if it's worth the hundred and fifty million dollars, put a paragraph in there that says, "And you're willing to contribute your share through paying a tax to help support uh, that hundred and fifty million dollar uh, additional investment." Uh, that paragraph got left out of the, yeah, exactly. of, the of, of the of the commentary. It's it's I've got a great idea on how to spend your money, yeah. <laughs> more of your money. 
Well, you should be and, thank, thankful to me that I come up with all these ideas on how to spend your money. Well, and Donna says it's amazing that a federal official is asking for state money. Congress spends that much money every second. I mean, he could, hey, Dan, why don't you just write a line into some bill to add to it if it's that important? I mean, you know, if we're giving away free money from somebody, like, just let's, you know, uh, it's the whole thing is just insane. Brad, we got about 90 seconds here. I'll give you the final thoughts for today. Well, I'll just, uh, on that point, they've already written, Lisa and Dan have already written into the, the infrastructure bill, Biden's infrastructure bill, $30 billion federal guarantee, debt guarantee for the damn project. So it's not like, I mean, it's not like the feds haven't come up with a lot of money on their own. And Dan would say, well, it's just $150 million for the, from the state standpoint. It's, you know, it gets tiresome. Uh, uh, nobody. Let, let's see if the private sector wants to do this project before we before we keep on going down this road. Yeah, where's the demand? Where is the private sector stepping up to say, okay, we'll shoulder half of this, we'll shoulder three quarters of it, we'll shoulder whatever, and they're just they're not. It's not there's not enough demand to make it work. Uh, as much as I'd love to see it, that 17 trillion cubic feet of gas just trapped up there waiting to do something with it. Not until the market says we need that. Is it going to happen? It'd be interesting, Brad, um, you know, in your spare time, since you've got all this spare time um, to do the analysis of what I mean, how much has been spent since the Murkowski and Palin administrations, when they first started getting into this, where the state was spending a lot of money on the front end of this whole gas line thing. And then through Walker and everything else, how much money have we spent on the state's preparation for the gas line, um, I mean, it's got to be, I mean, we're into the hundreds of millions of dollars already, right? Well, I, I think we're north of a billion dollars by now, Michael. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put that on my to-do list to, uh, might make an interesting chart of the week. I can just yeah. sort of visualize how to, how to stack it up. But uh, yeah, I think, it, I think it's, well, uh, maybe well north is too, too uh, generous, but I think it's north of a billion dollars. And I mean that and, money. And, 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 go ahead. And, well, and 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 across to cross, uh, to cross uh, subjects this week, some people are talking about, "Ooh, wouldn't it be a great investment for the Permanent Fund Corporation to to invest in Alaska's future by uh, by by investing in uh, in the gas line?" Again, the track <laughs> record, the track record of the state in investment in 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 projects like that. Uh, you know, Delta Barley and and uh, storage and and the th I mean, all you can think of is all these things that have like, oh, this will be great. <laughs> you know, it craters and you see the mushroom cloud from space and you're like, oh, God, uh, what happened there? Yeah, I don't think I want to endanger the permanent fund with something like that. I mean, it just it just doesn't economically make sense. But that's that's what I mean, that's what the permanent fund board is starting to it, it would be eking toward or start has been starting to eat toward with all these in-state investments. Right. Well, let's build Alaska up. Let's use some of this money for the benefit of the Alaska economy let's, and Alaska companies. And 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 to some degree, there's some speculation that that these initial investments, uh, this initial Alaska investment program was the first step to step up to investing in the in the LNG project. So, I mean, it's, <laughs> as I say, people can come up with all sorts of, through my entire career, people have come up with all sorts of great ideas about investing money. You know, I, I can make this return. I can do this. Your money. I don't want to put any of my money <laughs> into it. Your money. Uh, but but aren't these all aren't these all great ideas? And, and yeah, sure, they're great ideas. But you know, if there's such a great idea, Dan, put your money where put your money, not the federal money. You put a lot of federal money in there. Put your money where your mouth is by saying that uh, that there ought to be a, a tax uh, that would that would reach you uh, to support it. And 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 what you will have when you say that is crickets. It'll be oh no. Yeah, it, it benefits well, benefits all Alaskans, so it's okay to take the PFT to do it. Well, I mean, look, it would be great to have access to Alaskan gas, but the problem is, is by the time we built the pipeline out and did all this other kind of stuff, the economy of scale of just the demand in Alaska, you'd be paying three or four times what you're paying for gas right now. Uh, you know, based on just bringing that line down, because there's not enough demand to give it the volume and the economy of scale that it needs. Uh, I mean, it'd be great to have Alaskan gas. Don't get me wrong. And I think in the future, that's where, I mean, eventually there will be a drawdown of gas, worldwide gas enough that that will become viable. But up until then, 
you know, one day it'll be economical, but until that day, don't keep throwing money at it until you think it is. There's a lot of gas in the world, Michael. Oh, <laughs> yeah, there's a, you know, there's a huge amount of gas in the world. One day. I mean, who knows? It could be 2150 at this point. I have no idea how long it'll be before it becomes viable, but we do have a huge chunk of gas out there. And we do. We nice do. To use it, but. Be, it'd be great to monetize it. Absolutely. It'd be great to monetize it. But uh, I mean, we have a lot of ice. It'd be great to monetize the ice. I, we we have a lot of things, but but we can't monetize all of it. And and spending money thinking that, thinking that we're going to be able to monetize it, thinking that there's going to be this great payday at the end, especially when somebody's saying, I want to spend your money to, to, to monetize this thing. Um, I just, you know, you got to be, you got to be skeptical about it. You gotta yeah. be skeptical about it. Absolutely. Um, I agree with that. Um, it was, uh, what was it? Andrew Halcrow, um, was the candidate in what, 2004. He thought we could build a pipeline using the permanent fund. Yeah. Well, Halcrow was into that. Uh, Walker was into that at one point. They all thought that they could either use the permanent fund or, <coughs> excuse me, leverage the permanent fund as a, mm -hmm. uh, as collateral. <laughs> I think as collateral for the uh, for for the building a pipe, but it's a forty five billion dollar pipeline. It's not like it's gonna you know it's not like it's a drop in the bucket. Yeah, exactly. And even the equity portion. I mean, the equity portion is maybe twenty five uh, percent to to you know a third of that. So let's say it's fifteen fifteen billion dollars is what you have to come up with on the equity side and, and debt finance the rest of it. Uh, I mean, that, that's $15 billion. That's a lot of money uh, uh, just on its own. And it's, and it's, you know, and, and people say, yeah, it's a great deal. It's a great deal. Just use your money to, to, to finance it. Don't, don't tax me. Don't make me pay for any of it. Just use your money to finance. It'll be, you know, don't worry about it. It'd be, it'd be a great payoff for you. <laughs> um, I mean, I've had, I've, I've, I've had, uh, uh, investment bankers or financial managers that have smoother presentations than that. I mean, right. at least they, at least sometimes they say, well, I, I'm in this project. So I want, I want to, you know, let you participate in this project also. Um, yeah. Well, you want me to participate at 15 times the amount you're in it, but <laughs> I, 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 at least you're smooth enough to recognize that, that you've got to say you have some skin in the game yourself before you, before you right. try to drag in others. Uh, Sullivan isn't even saying that. Yeah. Well, Brad, uh, appreciate you coming on board. Thank you for joining us this morning. And as always, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. It's interesting stuff. I appreciate you helping us out this morning and giving us your thoughts on us. Appreciate you being here. Michael, uh, thanks for having me and uh, look forward to it again next week. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.